So in this lecture, I will discuss about absolutely continuous function. In the past lecture, I consider a function f from a, b to r, which uh, I assume to be monotone increasing. And we proved that uh, these functions are differentiable. So there exists a derivative f of x uh, almost everywhere. So, and we proved also that the derivative of the integral of this derivative is bounded by fx minus fa. And I give an example in which this inequality is strict. So now, uh, in this lecture, I will discuss functions for which we have an identity instead of this uh, inequality. So the lecture will be divided in a few parts. In the first part, I will um, introduce a function f. So let's fix a function f from AB to R. And let's assume that this function is it's integrable, which means that the integral from a to b of the absolute value of f d lambda is finite. Let's define uh, a function capital F of x, defined in the same interval, which will be given by the integral from a to x of this function f. And by this symbol, remember, I mean that we are multiplying f by the indicator function of the interval ax, f d lambda. So this defines a new function. Well, we will derive properties of this function, which will entail the definition of an absolutely continuous function. Then we will prove that f given uh, by this expression, e, well, that such a function is differentiable almost everywhere, and that its derivative is given by uh, small f. So the derivative of capital F is given by f almost everywhere. So these are the first part of the lecture, and then I will consider the absolutely continuous functions, and I will show that if a function is absolutely continuous, then it's differentiable, and it can be written as the integral of its derivative. But uh, I will return to that uh, later. So let's start by uh, considering properties of functions which are given by this equation in which f is an integrable function. So let's fix a function f from a, b to r which is integrable, which means that the absolute value of f integrated from a to b is uh, finite. And let's fix a constant c and define the function capital F by uh, this formula. And since f is integrable, remember that we know that for any given epsilon, we can find a delta such that, well, if the Lebesgue measure of a set B is smaller than delta, then the integral over F, the set B of the absolute value of F with respect to D lambda, now this is smaller or equal to epsilon. Right? So this is a property we proved for integrable functions, that for any given epsilon, we can find a strictly positive delta such that, well, if the Lebesgue measure of this set B, of any set B, is bounded by delta, then the integral of F over the set B is bounded by epsilon. Well, what does that mean for that function? Suppose now that we have some intervals, I1 up to Ij, or I m. So these are intervals. I j, it's the interval, say, A j, B j. And let's assume that these intervals are the joint. So that means that A j intersection A k 
it's empty if j is different from k. And let's assume that the sum of these intervals, j, so remember, this represents the length of the interval ij. So let's assume that the sum of the length is bounded by that given um, delta. Right? I fix an epsilon. I know that there exists this delta. Let's consider these intervals. Then what do I know? Well, by this uh, bound, I know that the integral over the union of ij of f d lambda, that this is bounded by epsilon. Okay. Well, but on the other hand, this is just equal because the intervals ij are the joint. This union is actually an union over the joint element, so this is a sum over j from 1 to m of the integral from over the set ij of f d lambda. And, um, well, what do I claim? I claim that the sum, remember ij is the interval aj bj, so f bj minus f aj, okay, by definition of my function f, this difference is equal to the integral from aj to bj of f. And we have seen that the absolute value of an integral is bounded by the integral of the absolute value. And now let's recall that the sum of the integrals over the intervals ij of f it's bounded by epsilon. So this is bounded by epsilon. So what do, did we prove for this function? Well, we proved that for any given epsilon, if I have a family, a finite family of intervals which are the joint and whose total length is bounded by delta, then the sum of the increments of the functions over the intervals ij, which is given by this expression, it's bounded by epsilon. So we proved that for any epsilon, I can find a delta such that if I have a family of the joint intervals whose total length is bounded by delta, then the sum of the increments of my functions f over these intervals is bounded by epsilon. Well, a function whose, which satisfies this property will be called an absolutely continuous function. So I will erase this blackboard and just uh, write down what the definition of an absolutely continuous function and observe that this function, the function given by um, this expression, is an absolutely continuous function. So definition. A function g defined in interval a, b to r is absolutely continuous if for any epsilon there exists a delta such that if you take ij to be the intervals aj, bj, and note that I'm taking these intervals as open intervals. 
Uh, this will help me later. So if I take these intervals ij as aj, bj, and I take a finite number of them, and I assume that they are, their intersection are empty, so that they are disjoint, and that their length, the total length of these intervals, it's bounded by delta. Then the increment of the function g over these intervals, so g b, b j minus g a j, it's bounded by epsilon. Okay. So let me uh, repeat the definition. A function g will be called absolutely continuous if for any positive epsilon, I can find a strictly positive delta such that, well, if you take any finite family of intervals, open intervals, which are the joint two by two, and such that the total length of these intervals is bounded by delta, then the increment of the sum of the increments of my function g over these intervals, it's bounded by epsilon. So this is the definition. And in my previous blackboard, I proved that a function f given by this expression, where small f is an integrable function, it is absolutely continuous. So we have here an example of absolutely continuous functions. So I will prove two theorems in this lecture. The first theorem is the following one. So assume that you have a function f which is integrable define capital F by this formula, then I claim that F is differentiable almost everywhere, and F prime, so the derivative of this function F, is equal to F almost everywhere. So this is the first main theorem of this lecture. Assume that uh, the function f is given by this expression, then it's differentiable almost everywhere, and f prime, it's equal uh, to f almost everywhere. And the second theorem is as follows. Well, assume that you have a function g defined on a, b to r, which is absolutely continuous. So here is the important Uh, assumption, so I assume that the function g is absolutely continuous, then g is differentiable almost everywhere, and g of x is equal to g of a plus the integral from a to x of g prime d lambda. So this means that not only it's differentiable, but also that g prime it's integrable and that g of x it's equal to um, a constant plus the integral of g prime. So this is uh, essentially the converse of that statement, right? You start here with a function which is given by this expression. You show that then f is equal to f prime, and then you have a certain converse. If the function is absolutely continuous, then it can be written in this way, where f is um, g prime, right? So uh, these are the two main theorems I will prove in this lecture, and we'll start from uh, the first one, which, um, which is easier. So uh, I just recall here the theorem we want to prove. So we want to show that f is differentiable and that f prime is equal to f. The proof, as usual, it's divided in several steps. So I will start with step one. And in step one, I want to convince you that it's enough to um, 
prove the theorem for functions f which are non-negative. So take your function f. You know that f can be written as its positive part minus its negative part. So let me define f plus as of x as the constant c plus the integral from a to x of f plus the lambda. <coughs> this is well defined because, of course, f plus is uh, integrable. So f plus, it's positive. And it's bounded by the absolute value of f. And therefore, and the same holds for f minus. So both functions here are integrable because they are bounded by an integrable function. And so this integral is uh, well defined. In the same way, I will define f minus x as the integral from a to x of f minus d lambda. So now, of course, f is equal to f plus minus f minus by linearity of the integral. And suppose that you can show that f plus is differentiable almost everywhere. And f minus 2. And suppose that you can prove also that f plus and f minus prime are equal to f plus minus almost everywhere. Right? So if this is true, what you get from this equation is that, well, f prime is differentiable almost everywhere. It will be, its derivative will be given by the difference of the derivative of f plus and f minus. Well, if we prove the result for non-negative functions, so we have this identity. So this is f plus minus f minus, and this is f. So if we are able to prove um, this sentence by linearity, we get uh, the full result. So I hope now that you are convinced that in this theorem, it's enough to prove it for functions f, which are non-negative. And this is what I will do in the next step. So up to now, we proved that it's enough to uh, prove the theorem in the case in which the function f is non-negative. So let's assume that f is non-negative. If f is non-negative, this means that f of x is mo it's a monotone function, a monotone increasing function. And we have seen in the previous lecture that a monotone increasing function is almost everywhere differentiable. So f prime exists almost everywhere. So f is uh, differentiable almost everywhere. So this was the first assertion of the theorem, uh, which follows from a previous result. Now we have to prove that f prime is equal to f. Well, we know that f is differentiable. Let's represent by let's represent by f prime the derivative of the function f. We know from a previous result that the integral from a to x of f prime d lambda f prime is non-negative, and that this is less or equal than f of x minus f. So we proved uh, this inequality. But now fx minus fa, well, this is equal to the integral from ax to f d lambda. So we have an inequality. We have that the integral from a to x of f prime, that this is equal to the integral from ax of f d lambda. So in order to prove 
So what I claim is that, so my claim, and this is what I want to prove now, is that we have actually an identity here. So I claim that a x f prime d lambda is actually equal to the integral from a to x of f d lambda. Okay? We know that this is always less or equal, but what I claim is that there is an identity. And this is what I want to prove. So this is my um, second step. Prove that claim. Right? So to prove this claim, I will first assume that, well, I will assume that f is bounded. So I assume that f, the absolute value of f, it's bounded by, actually, since f is non-negative, that f is bounded by a constant, k. So let's assume that f is bounded by k. Now, let me define fn of x as fx plus 1 over n minus fx divided by 1 over n. Right? And just to make sure that fn is defined in the interval a, b, let's extend the definition of capital F to uh, R plus by setting that f of z is equal to fb for z large or equal than b. So let's assume that f is constant to the right of b. Well, by definition, so I claim that this function f, the sequence of functions fn, well, on the one hand, since capital F is differentiable almost everywhere, as n goes to infinity, this expression will converge to f prime of x almost everywhere. For all points x for which the derivative of f exists at x, this expression will converge to f prime. And I also claim that fn is bounded by the same constant which bounds f. And why is this so? Well, because fn of x, which is positive because f its monotone increasing, well, this is equal to, by definition of f, the difference between f at x plus 1 over n and f of x, it's just the integral from x to x plus 1 over n of f d lambda. And since f is bounded by k, this integral is bounded by the integral of the constant k over this interval. So this is bounded by k times the length of this interval, which is 1 over n. And this 1 over n will cancel this 1 over 1 over n. So this is bounded by k. And this is uniform over all x, which means that this sequence is uniformly bounded. So the supremum over all x in the interval a, b of this expression is bounded by k. And therefore, I can apply the bounded convergence theorem from fn to f prime. So I know that by the bounded convergence theorem, that the integral of over the interval ax of fn d lambda, that this is converging to the integral of ax f prime d lambda. Okay? This sequence is uniformly bounded by k. It's converging almost everywhere to f prime. And therefore, by the bounded convergence theorem, this the integral of this sequence is converging to 
uh, the integral of the limit, which is f prime. So I know that um, f prime a to x d lambda it's equal to the limit of ax fn d lambda. Okay? But now let's recall the definition of fn. So I will just erase uh, this line because I already wrote it there. And I need some space. So this is the limit as n tends to infinity of the integral from a to x of fn. But fn is this expression. So this is fz plus 1 over n minus fz divided by 1 over n dz. And we computed something uh, similar in the previous lecture. So here I have the integral of f translated by 1 over n in the interval ax. So this is the limit of, let me write n. This is the 1 over n here. So maybe let me place it there. Then I have the integral from a plus 1 over n to x plus 1 over n f d lambda minus the integral from a um, to x of f d lambda. Right? Well, this limit, you see that uh, here I'm integrating from a plus 1 over n to x plus 1 over n, but I'm taking out the integral from a to x. So this will give me an integral from x to x plus 1 over n. So this is the limit of n. The integral from x to x plus 1 over n of f d lambda minus the integral from a to a plus 1 over n of f d lambda. Okay. Now I claim that f is continuous, so I'll just prove that in a second. Well, I claim that f is continuous, and since f is continuous, its integral from x to x plus 1 over n multiplied by n, this is converging as n goes to infinity to f of x. And by the same reason, the integral from a to a plus 1 over n multiplied by n of f is converging to f a. So for that, I'm using the fact that f is continuous. And I will show that in a second. And now f x minus f a, by definition of x, is the integral from a to x of f d lambda. And there we have our identity. The integral from a to x of f prime d lambda, it's indeed equal to the integral from a to x of f d lambda. So this, is, this proves our claim in the case in which f is bounded, provided I show that f is continuous. So I will erase that, prove that f is continuous, to conclude the proof of this assertion in the case in which f is uh, uniformly bounded. So let me prove that f is continuous. And well, this is uh, very easy, because actually we already proved that f is absolutely continuous, which is stronger than continuity. But anyway, let me show that f is continuous. Fix epsilon, positive, and fix a point x in A, B, 
and you want to prove that uh, the function f is continuous at that point, well, since small f is integrable, you know that there exists delta positive such that, well, if the measure of the set b, the Lebesgue measure of the set b, is smaller than delta, then the integral over b of f d lambda is bounded by epsilon. Right? So if I take y such that y minus x is smaller than delta, fy minus fx, well, assume that y is larger than x. The same argument holds for y smaller than x. So fy minus fx in absolute value. By definition of f, this is equal to the absolute value of the integral from x to y of f d, d lambda. And this is bounded by the integral from x to y of f. Actually, here I'm assuming that f is positive, so these things are equal. But anyway, it's bounded. And now, by this argument here, well, since the interval x, y has length smaller than delta, by um, this property of my function f, this is bounded by epsilon. So we just proved that for any x, any epsilon, I can find a delta such that if the distance between y and x is smaller than delta, then the difference between fy and fx is smaller than epsilon, which is the continuity of the function f. So indeed, my function f is continuous. And this completes the proof of this identity in the case in which f is bounded. So now uh, let's consider the general case. And note that since I want to prove the identity, and I already have that this expression is smaller than that one, I just need to prove the reverse inequality. Okay. So let's take f, and let's bound it. So let's define fm to be uh, the minimum between f and m. Right. So now this function fm it's uniformly bounded, so it satisfies that identity. And therefore, I know um, that, well, if I define the same function using fm instead of f, I get a family of differentiable functions whose derivative are equal, are given by that fm. So let me write that. So let's define fm of x as c plus the integral from a to x of fm d lambda. Okay. Now, by the first step, since the function fm is bounded, I know that fm, the integral from a to x of fm prime d lambda, it's equal to the integral from a to x of fm d lambda. Okay, this is by the first step. So, on the other hand, since fm is less or equal than f, so this function fm is clearly less or equal than f, this is less or equal than c plus ax, the integral from a to x f d lambda, and this is equal to fx. Okay? So I have also the bound that fm is less or equal than f. And uh, moreover, fm prime, I claim that fm prime it's uh, less or equal than f prime, right? Well, because fm prime is 
it's the limit from x. Sorry, let me write it. Limit as h goes to 0 of fm x plus h minus fm x divided by h. Okay. But by the same argument, fm x plus h, OK, let me write it to be. So this is the limit as h goes to 0. What is fm x plus h minus fm? Well, here's the definition. So this is 1 over h, the integral from x to x plus h of fm. Okay. But fm, it's bounded by f. So this is less or equal than the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over h, x, x plus h of f d lambda. And this is, so now I can go back. This is f x plus h minus f x divided by h. And when I take the limit, this is equal to f prime of x. So this inequality holds for all points x for which both fm prime, fm, and f are differentiable. But this happens everywhere. So uh, in a set whose complement has measure 0, we have that the derivative of fm is bounded by the derivative of f. So I proved here a few properties of my functions fm. Okay. Two properties are important. The first one is that f prime m is equal to fm. Um, OK, so here is the first property which I, I want to keep. So the integral from a to x of fm prime is equal to from to the integral from a to x of fm d lambda. And now I prove the second important um, inequality which I will use, which is written here. So let me erase this, erase that and add here the fact that um, I have that fm prime x is less or equal than f prime of x almost everywhere. And now I have the two um, properties to conclude um, this, the, the proof of this assertion because Remember, I want to show that this integral is bounded by that one. So let's write that integral, ax, f d lambda. Okay. So this is the, this term. Well, <coughs> fm, it's increasing to f. Okay. These are non-negative functions. So by the monotone convergence theorem, I have that this integral is equal to the limit as m goes to infinity of the integral from a to x of fm d lambda. Right? This is the monotone convergence theorem. Now, let's use my first um, identity or inequality. I know that the integral from a to x of fm is equal to the integral from in the same interval of fm prime. So this is the limit of the integral from a to x of fm prime. Okay. So that comes from this identity. Now let's use the fact that fm prime is bounded by f prime. So since f prime fm prime it's bounded by f prime the integral of fm prime it's bounded by the integral of f prime so this is less or equal and well this expression doesn't depend on m so this is less or equal than the integral from a to x of f prime d lambda and this is the inequality we wanted to prove we wanted to prove that the integral from a to x of f d lambda it's bounded by the integral from a to x of f prime d lambda. 
So we just proved this inequality. And we knew already that uh, the other inequality was in force. So with these two inequalities, we get the identity, which was the claim in the uh, second step. So this completes the proof of uh, the second step, which was the proof of this claim. So we are now almost at the end of the proof. So this is the last step, step three of the proof. So we have shown up to now <coughs> that the integral from a to x of f prime is equal to, uh, to the integral from a to x of f, the lambda. But this is not what we want to prove exactly. What we want to prove is that f prime is equal to f. So we know that the integrals over these intervals are equal, and we want to conclude that actually f prime is equal to f. Okay? So this holds for any x, and we know that f is um, non-negative, f prime is non-negative, and they are both integrable. Right? They are integrable because f, by assumption, it's an integrable function. And since we have this identity, <coughs> and f prime it's non-negative, the integral from a to b of f prime is equal to the integral from a to b of f. And this is finite, so f prime is integrable. Okay. Okay. What I claim <coughs> is that this identity implies that if you take the integral of f prime over set A, that this is equal to the integral over the set A of f d lambda. And I claim that this, is, this holds for any A <coughs> in the um, Lebesgue sigma algebra. If we prove that, then we, we have already shown that if two functions satisfy this property for any um, set A in the sigma algebra, then they are equal almost surely. So we just need to prove that this identity holds. So we have to pass from uh, this identity, which holds only for sets A, which are intervals of the type Ax, to uh, this identity, which holds for any set A in the Lebesgue sigma algebra. So how to uh, pass from an identity which holds for certain sets to an identity which holds for uh, all sets in a sigma algebra? Well, we have seen that many, many times. And one extremely useful tool is to use the monotone classes. So <coughs> first, so I want to use the monotone classes. So let me call C the family <coughs> of sets A in AB for which uh, this identity holds. So let me call this set C. So C this is the all subsets of AB for which, uh, let's say that which are in the Lebesgue, sigma algebra, and for which f prime, the integral of f prime over a, is equal to the integral of f over a. Well, I know already that the intervals ax belongs to my family c. Okay. Now, if I take an interval ay and say that y is larger than x, I can take the difference in these identities to conclude that xy belongs to my family C, right? These two intervals belong to the family. So if I take the difference, I get the integral over xy, which means that the identity will hold for xy. Now, by linearity, So observe that, well, these are the elements of the semi-algebra. By linearity of the integral, I get that uh, all intervals of type x, j, y, j 
belong to my class C. Okay, this is by linearity of the interval, we go from one interval to the joint union of intervals. And these uh, sets form exactly the algebra of subsets of the um, generated by the intervals. So we just proved that this identity holds actually not only for these intervals, but for all uh, sets A which belong to the algebra. Now I claim that C it's a monotone class. That's very easy to show just by using the monotone uh, theorem, so the convergence of monotone functions. If you take a family a n which is increasing to a, you can pass to the limit and if this identity holds for each a n, it will hold for the union of a n, just by the um, monotone convergence theorem. In the same way, if you get a decreasing family of sets, you can use the bounded convergence theorem and you can use the bounded convergence theorem because these two functions are integrable. So you can use the bounded convergence theorem in order to pass from this identity of a n to um, the identity for a. So let me be slightly more precise. So let's consider a sequence a n decreasing to a. Let's assume that a n belongs to c and therefore that this identity holds for a n. Now use the bounded convergence theorem in order to extend this identity to the set A. That will prove that C is a monotone class. Well, but if you have a monotone class which contains the algebra of intervals, it will contain the sigma algebra generated by the intervals, which is um, the Lebesgue sigma algebra. And therefore, you prove this identity for all sets A in the Lebesgue sigma algebra. And once you know that this holds for any set A in the Lebesgue sigma algebra, it's easy to conclude that F prime has to be equal to F almost everywhere. This has been proven in a previous lecture. So um, if you're not convinced, go back and uh, recall the properties of the integral. So that completes the proof of the first main theorem of this lecture. Let's turn to uh, the second main theorem, which I recall here. So I'm assuming that given a, fun a function, I'm fixing a function which is absolutely continuous. I want to show that it's, this function is differentiable almost everywhere, that its derivative is integrable, and that f is given by the integral of its derivative. So this is the second main theorem of this lecture. And before I start proving that uh, theorem, let me derive some properties of the absolutely continuous function. So my first claim is that f is of bounded variation. f has bounded variation. Fine, so let's recall what absolutely continuous means. Since f is absolutely continuous, this means that for any given epsilon, I can find a delta such that if I have intervals ij, which I'm writing as aj, bj, these are open intervals, which are the joint two by two, and such that the total length of these intervals it's bounded by delta, then what I know, so this is a family, finite family of intervals, well, then what I know is that the sum of the increments it's bounded by epsilon. So this is what um, the hypothesis tells me. Okay, so let's take epsilon equal to one. Right. And for that epsilon, I know that 
there is a given delta. So here is my interval AB. And I want to investigate the, um, I want to show that F has bounded variation. So to show that F has bounded variation, let's fix pi, which is a partition of my interval AB. So these are points A, which equal T0, which is smaller than T1, up to smaller than T, let's call it um, N, and this is equal to B. So this is a partition of my interval AB, and I want to estimate the variation of my function f along this partition pi, and this is the sum of f tj plus 1 minus f of tj. And the sum, it's going from um, 0 to n minus 1. And I have to show that this expression, it's uniformly bound. So I need to bound this expression by a constant which doesn't depend on pi. So here are the points. So this is t0, so t1 somewhere here, t2, and so on, up to t n minus 1. Okay. Well, and as I said, well, let's give an epsilon equal to 1. For that, well, I chose 1 as I could have chosen anything. Let's fix some epsilon, say epsilon equal to 1. Then since f has bound, s is absolutely continuous, I know that there exists a delta for which this is satisfied. So let's assume that here is delta. Okay. And, well, what does this um, condition tell me? Well, let's assume that t3 is somewhere over here, right? Well, it tells me that Observe that if I sum the length of these intervals, I get, so from t0 to t1, t1 to t2, t2 to delta, I get something, I get intervals, open intervals, which are disjoint, 2 by 2. The total length is bounded by delta, so that tells me that the increments, the sum of the increments of f along these um, partition, it's bounded by epsilon, which is equal to 1. So I know that the total, the sum of the increments over this interval, it's bounded by 1. Well, say that 2 delta is here, so the sum of the increments over this interval will also be bounded by 1, and so on. So let's assume that at some point here I have, so that will be, uh, let's say, k times delta. So let's say that k times delta is somewhere over here, and here it's k plus 1 times delta. <coughs> and here is k minus 1 delta. So I know that, so I guess here it's, I don't know, maybe that's k delta. So I know that the increments over this uh, partition, it's also bounded by 1, and that the increments over this partition, in particular, the increment over Tn minus 1, or k delta and b, it's also bounded by 1. Okay. <coughs> so first, what is k? <coughs> well, k was such that, is such that k times delta, it's <coughs> smaller than <coughs> this length, <coughs> and this length it's, um, so I'm sorry, I said here it's delta, but actually it's a plus delta, right? This is a plus 2 delta, a plus k delta. So k delta, it's bounded by b minus a. And k plus 1, and this is a. And a plus k plus 1 delta, it's strictly larger than beta, than b. So k plus 1 delta, it's strictly larger than b minus a. So this tells me that k is smaller or equal than b minus a delta, and this is smaller than k plus 1. 
So actually, k is equal to the integer value. So this is the largest integer smaller or equal than b minus a over delta. So I'm representing by this symbol the integer part of this real number, which is the largest integer which is smaller or equal to um, that real number. So k is that one. And so how many intervals I have here? Well, I have up to here uh, k intervals. So this is the first, delta, the second at 2 delta. So the kth at k delta, and there is an extra interval here. And on each of these intervals, the variation is at most 1. So the total variation will be bounded by k plus 1. And what is k plus 1? It's given by this expression. So this is equal to 1 plus b minus a divided by delta. So what I claim is that the total variation of my function f in the interval a, b, it's bounded by 1 plus the integer part of b minus a divided by delta. And um, let's prove it. So now I want to write down um, the, well, the argument I presented, which is I want to make it uh, rigorous. So the first thing uh, I want to do is I want to add to pi the points a plus delta, a plus 2 delta, and so on. So let me call um, here pi prime will be uh, a new finite partition of the interval a, b, which the one I get by adding to pi the points a plus k uh, plus l times delta, where l is ranging from uh, 1 up to k delta, up to k. Okay. Where k is given by b minus a times delta. So this is a new partition, and we have seen that the variation of a function f over a partition, well, if I take a larger partition, the total variation it's may only increase. So that the variation of the function f over the original partition pi, it's bounded by the variation of my function f over the partition p prime. And the variation over um, this partition, so maybe now I need some space. So maybe let me uh, erase this piece of the blackboard. Now what I want, it's um, I want to enumerate pi prime. So pi prime is a new partition in which a is equal to s, let's call it s0. This is smaller than, and then I have here some s n1, which is equal to a plus delta. And this is smaller than uh, sn plus 1. And this is smaller than sn2, which is equal to a plus 2 delta, and so on, up to sn uh, some k which is a plus delta k. And then this is smaller than s, let's say, uh, t, which is equal to b. Okay. So I'm just um, enumerating my new partition. And I know that my new partition contains the point a plus delta, a plus 2 delta, up to a plus k delta. So there is an index n1 such that sn1 is a plus delta, an index n2 such that sn2 it's a plus 2 delta, and so on. And now, um, uh, 
V, the variation of F along P prime, I can write that as, well, I will sum from I, from uh, N1, Nj, to Nj plus 1 minus 1 of F Si plus 1 minus Fsi. That may, it may look complicated, but actually it's very simple. I just want to isolate the first um, increments, so the, the increments in the first interval, which goes from A to A plus delta, then the increments for A plus delta to A plus 2 delta. This means the increments from Sn1 to Sn2. So here I'm summing from S and j up to nj plus 1. And the sum here goes from uh, j, which goes from, so let me call that s uh, and 0. So n0 it will be 0. And let me call st, that will be s and k. It's not um, OK, s and k. And this will be s and k plus 1. Right? And so in this sense, j will go from 0 to um, k. And now, uh, since in each of these sums, the total length is bounded by delta, because, well, I chose exactly this length to be delta, each of these contributions it's bounded by epsilon, which is 1. And therefore, the total sum here, it's bounded by k plus 1 times 1, which is exactly what's written here. And k, if you remember, it's the integer part of b minus a divided by delta. And so this proves that this expression, it's bounded by 1 plus the integer part of b minus a divided by delta. And this holds for any partition pi. So I can take the supremum over all partition pi to get that the total variation of my function f in the interval a, b, it's bounded by this constant. And this proves that f is indeed a function whose total variation is bounded. So it's a function of bounded variation, which was uh, my claim. So we prove that f is a function of bounded variation. And we know that if a function f has bounded variation, it can be written as the difference of f1 minus f2, where fj are monotone increasing. So um, take this function, which is absolutely continuous. We know that it's, uh, it has bounded variation. So we have already proved that this function is differentiable almost everywhere. And um, moreover, its derivative, it's given by the difference between the derivative of two monotone functions. And these uh, monotone functions the variation of these functions, f1 and f2, it's bounded by the total variation of f. What is the total variation of f1? The total variation of my function f1 is in the interval a, b. It's just f1, b minus f1, a, right? So. This is bounded, and we know, because we proved that uh, the integral of f1 prime d lambda, it's bounded by f1b minus f1a. Right. So f1 prime, which is non-negative, because f1 is monotone increasing, this shows that f1 prime is integrable. And the same thing for f2 prime. 
So F2 prime, by the same reasons, is integrable. And therefore, F prime, which is the difference of two integrable functions, is integrable. So we know already that we already proved the first two assertions, which means that we proved that uh, the function is differentiable and that its derivative is an integrable function. Now it remains to show that um, this identity holds. And this is um, what I will prove now. So <clears throat> at this point, I want to prove uh, this identity. So let's prove that. And what I will do is I will define a new function, g of x, which is equal to fa plus the integral from a to x of f prime. Okay. Let's define this function and recall that f prime is integrable, right? So what do I know from that? I know two things. The first one is that g is absolutely continuous. Right? Since f prime is integrable, we have seen that a function g defined by um, this expression, this integral, it's absolutely continuous. And we know also, by the first theorem I proved, is that, well, g is differentiable almost everywhere, and the derivative of g is equal to f prime almost everywhere. Okay. So if I take g minus f, okay, f, the function I started with, well, f I know by assumption that it's absolutely continuous. And the function g defined by this expression, it's absolutely continuous. So the difference is absolutely continuous. Let me call f the difference. And I leave it to you to prove that if I have two functions which are absolutely continuous, their difference is also absolutely continuous. That's very easy. So this function f, which is the difference of these two functions, is absolutely continuous. And also, well, g is differentiable, and its derivative is equal to f prime almost everywhere. This means that f prime exists because, well, g is differentiable, f is differentiable, so f prime exists, and it is equal to g prime minus f prime, and this is zero almost everywhere. So I have a function f, which is absolutely continuous, and whose derivative is equal to 0 almost everywhere. I claim, and I will prove that in a minute, that these two properties imply that f is constant. Okay. Well, if f is constant, this means that g minus f is constant, But at a, g is equal to f a, which is, so at a, g and f coincide, so this constant has to be equal to 0, and therefore g is equal to f. So this implies that actually g is equal to f, right? Well, but if g is equal to f, we proved that f of x is equal to f a, plus this expression, which is exactly the uh, last assertion of the theorem. So actually, the proof of this theorem relies on this result. This is the main uh, step in the proof of this theorem. We have to show that we, if we have a function which is absolutely continuous and whose derivative is equal to 0 almost everywhere, then f is constant, and this is what I will prove in the next blackboard. So we reduce the proof of the theorem to the proof of this lemma, which states that if I have a function f defined on the interval a, b, which is absolutely continuous, and whose derivative is equal to 0 almost everywhere, 
then f it's constant. So let's prove this lemma. And this is a very nice application of a Vitalis covering. Okay. Let's fix a C in the interval AB. And I want to prove that f of C is equal to f of A. So let's consider AC. And I want to uh, construct a Vitali covering of this interval. Actually, not exactly of this interval. Let me take E, the points of x in the interval AC, for which f prime of x is equal to 0. I know that. Uh, I know that the Lebesgue measure, so the function is differentiable. So f prime, it's a function. So this set, it's measurable. And what I know is that the complement of this set has measure 0. So what I know is that if I take AC and I remove from AC the set E, well, the measure of this set, it's equal to 0. And I want to construct a Vitali covering of this set E. Uh, how will I do that? Well, um, it's very similar to uh, the proof of the last lecture in which I construct also Vitali's covering for um, functions which were monotone. I will fix an x in AC, in this, my set E. Well. For that point x in E, I know that the derivative of f exists at x, and it is equal to 0. So I know that the limit of fx plus h minus fx divided by h, and say that I'm taking h positive, that this is equal to 0. So let me. I know that there exist h0 such that, let me fix some epsilon. There exists an h0 such that if h is smaller than h0, I have two properties. The first one is that fx plus h minus fx it's bounded by epsilon times h, because this limit is 0, so it will be smaller than epsilon for sufficiently small. And also, I want the interval x, x plus h, to be contained in AC. So remember, x is the point of AC. So I can take uh, h0 sufficiently small for x plus h to be smaller than c. So I have these two properties, and this is my family I. Okay. So my family I, it's composed of all intervals which can be obtained in such a way. So for all points x in AC for which f prime of x is equal to 0, and then I take h sufficiently small for uh, these two properties to hold, I mean this inequality and the fact that these intervals are contained in AC. And I claim that my family I is a Vitali covering of my set E. Why is that so? Well, fix a delta and fix an x in E. Since x uh, is in E, I have an infinite number of intervals which belong to my, so x belongs to the interval x, x plus h. And in these intervals, I have infinitely many of them for h as small as I wish. So I can take, well, the length of this interval is h. h is strictly positive, and h can be taken bounded by delta. So this proves that uh, this family forms indeed a Vitali covering of my set E. And since uh, this family 
forms a Vitali covering uh, by the corollary of Vitali's lemma, I can take a finite subcovering. So, um, let me uh, remind that f is an absolutely continuous function. And this means that for that given epsilon, there exists a delta such that, well, if the intervals, the total, le total length of intervals is bounded by delta, then the total variation of uh, the sum of the increments, let me write this. I just don't want to repeat the uh, very long definition of absolutely continuity. But absolutely continuity meant that for any fixed epsilon, I could find a strictly positive delta, such that if I take open intervals whose total length is bounded by delta, then the variation of f along these intervals is bounded by epsilon. Okay? So let's fix that delta. And in the uh, corollary of Vitali's lemma, we know that given that delta, we can find a finite covering. So there exists i1 up to im. And let me call these intervals. Well, these intervals are the joint 2 by 2. They are closed. They are one of these. So they are of type xj, xj plus hj. And what I know is that the measure of E minus these intervals is bounded by delta. Okay? I know that for any delta, I can find this finite Vitali covering of my set E. Fine, this is very good, because now I can estimate um, the variation of my function f on the interval ax. Okay. So first, I claim that, well, since the measure of ac minus e is 0, I can replace here e by ac. So actually, what I have is that the measure of ac minus this disjoint union of intervals, that this is bounded by m, by delta. Okay? Well, because this set, it's contained in the union of this set with this set. And well, so the measure of that set, it's bounded by the measure of this set plus the measure of that set, and this is bounded by delta. Okay? Now I will. Um, erase many uh, things which are not needed anymore. And I want to draw a picture. Of my interval. So here is uh, my interval AC. And um, I just obtain these intervals. And I know that the uh, total length, these are intervals. So if I take this interval and I take remove from that interval these intervals, I get the union of intervals. So let me assume that these intervals are ordered. So here is x1 and x1 plus h1. Here is x2 and x2 plus h2, and finally xm, and xm plus hm. Okay. Of course, this picture is misleading, because what I know is that the total length of ac minus uh, this interval, this total length is delta. So if I take this length, and I add this length, this length, and this length, 
what I get is something uh, smaller than delta, and it's clearly, well, this picture um, indicates the opposite, but it will be easier to explain the proof with uh, such a picture. So what I want is to compare Fc with Fa. And what I will do, it's, well, I will write Fc minus Fa as this difference. I know that if I add the increment here, so the absolute value of the difference, the absolute plus the absolute value of the difference in these points, the absolute value in these points and the absolute value of these points, this has to be smaller than epsilon because the length, the total length of these intervals, it's bounded by delta. And delta was chosen in such a way that if the total length of these intervals is bounded by delta, then the sum of the increments is bounded by epsilon. Right? So what I know is that if I take fx1 minus fa plus fx2 minus fx1 plus h1 plus plus <coughs> the last one will be fxm right minus fxm minus 1 plus hm minus 1 and plus the last one which is fc minus fxm plus hm okay since what is uh, the length of these intervals well the length of these intervals is exactly the length of this set the measure of this set and the measure of this set it's bounded by delta so this means that the length of these intervals it's bounded by delta and since the length is bounded by delta and delta was chosen according to epsilon i have the the increments which is this it's bounded by epsilon okay. so all so this sum the contribution of the sum of these contributions it's bounded by epsilon and now well it remains so to estimate the contributions inside of these intervals. Unfortunately, I erased the property, but the property was that fx plus h minus fx, that this was bounded by epsilon times h. Okay? So if you go back to the video, you just remind that the property of these intervals were that they satisfy this inequality. So what I get here is that fx1 plus h1 minus fx1 plus, plus fxm plus hm minus fxm. Each one of these intervals belong to my Vitali covering. So they fulfill this inequality. So this is bounded by epsilon times the length. Okay. But so we have the length of the first interval plus the length of the second interval plus the length of the last interval. And the sum of these lengths, it's clearly bounded by the length of the interval, which is c minus a. Okay. So this contribution, it's bounded by epsilon times c minus a. So the contribution, let's say, in the, of the green intervals while the pink intervals give a contribution which is bounded by epsilon. So Fc minus Fa, it's less or equal than this sum plus that sum, right? Because we are summing first, we are decomposing this difference as Fc minus Fxm plus Hm, which 
belongs to the pink path, and then we have a green path, which is here, then a pink path, followed by a green path, and so on. So all the pink contribution, it's written here, and the contribution, the pink contribution is bounded by epsilon, while the green contribution is bounded by epsilon c minus a. So this proves that fc minus fa is bounded by epsilon times 1 plus c minus a. And since epsilon is uh, arbitrary, we can send epsilon to zero to conclude that fc has to be equal to fa, which means that f is constant because c was any point in the interval a, b. So this proves that any, well, this proves the lemma. The lemma states that any absolutely continuous function whose derivative is equal to zero almost everywhere is constant. And with that, we complete the proof of the second main theorem of this lecture. And uh, this completes uh, this lecture.